today I'm uh, going to talk about the IPCC report. Uh, I'm, as, as uh, was already announced, uh, I'm one of the authors of the IPCC report. And in my presentation, I will indicate how we as IPCC authors came to our conclusions, and we, I will share with you the reasoning. And specifically, I would like to talk a bit about whether we can still reach the Paris Agreement. Uh, can we uh, reduce emissions still low enough? And maybe to some degree the title, how, how low can we go, has also something to do with the fact that we haven't responded yet. And I would like to say something about that. So the first start is with the Paris Agreement. And so as some of you might remember in 2015, we have promised uh, uh, as countries worldwide uh, that we wanted to try to prevent climate change by staying well below two degrees and preferably try to stay below 1.5 degrees. And now the question is, what is needed to meet these goals? And can we still do that? But maybe as a start, I would like to remind you a bit about what is climate change. Uh, and so the big, the big thing is that uh, the sun is radiating the Earth. And as a result, uh, it's a bit warmer here at Earth. But if that was the whole story, uh, then it would be minus 15 degrees on average on Earth. And luckily, that is not the whole story, because uh, some of the warmth that is going back into the uh, into the uh, radiate from the from the from the Earth hits all kinds of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and these start to radiate that warmth, that energy back in all directions, and so partly also back to the Earth. And as a result, this works as, as a kind of a blanket. It's the natural greenhouse effect. And this is already discovered in the 19th century. There is nothing uh, strange about this. This is, this is simply well known. But also, already in the 19th century, Arrhenius was thinking, OK, if this works like this, and CO2 is one of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, what happens if we start to put more CO2 in the atmosphere uh, by burning fossil fuels? Wouldn't that mean automatically that it gets warmer? And so. Uh, by the, uh, the end of the 19th century, he published this famous article where he said that there can, there's, there's this also this anthropogenic enhanced greenhouse gas effect. And after that, the story becomes a little bit more difficult because, okay, that means more energy, but where is that energy going? Um, and that took us uh, a long time to exactly find out, uh, but by, not by now we know that this, this is going to increase the temperature on Earth. And that is quite serious. Uh, because we know that the CO2 at, uh, in, the uh, in the atmosphere has increased quite a bit. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the left you see the uh, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere over the last 800,000 years. It goes up and it goes down a bit. Uh, but as a result of burning of fossil fuels, we have now increased the CO2 concentrations uh, to uh, uh, quite a lot above the natural level. And we can see the consequences as well. Uh, we see that the Earth is warming. And over the last uh, about um, 150 years, uh, the Earth has warmed by about 1.2 degrees Celsius. This is simply also not un uh, indisputable. We can simply measure this. And as a result, uh, we see also kind, all kinds of climate impacts. I just had to get some headlines of this year, uh, but climate change linked to pa Pakistan floods study finds this summer. Limburg flooding last year caused by climate change, researchers find. Climate change made India heat wave 100 times more likely. And so we are experiencing currently uh, climate change and the world is rapidly becoming affected by climate change. So what is the cause of this? Uh, this is the CO2 that we are adding to the atmosphere and the different sectors that are emitting uh, CO2. And so partly it is related to energy production uh, directly the CO2 emissions uh, from uh, mining and from uh, refineries. A big share is coming from electricity production. Uh, we have buildings, industry, transport, agriculture as well, land use change. And we can add to that actually also the fact that there are two other greenhouse gases, which are methane and nitrous oxide. Uh, and then the picture becomes quite clear. The emissions are associated uh, with many things that we do as humans. It's associated with the, the way we live, the buildings, our buildings. It's, uh, it's related to the goods we consume and that we are produced by industry. It's directly related to the way that we travel. 
and it's also related to our food. Yeah, to basically everything that we do is at the moment creating greenhouse gas emissions. And so getting rid of this stuff means changing more or less everything. So if we try to understand how this works, we have to understand this whole chain of events coming from human activities to energy to emissions to greenhouse gas to climate change and to impacts. And so we have to have follow that whole causal chain. But not only that, uh, we have to uh, see how this develops into the future. We have to see how this uh, relations work in, in time. Uh, if I build a coal, a coal power station now, that power station is going to be there maybe for 40 years or so. Uh, and so uh, somehow I have to take that into account. I have to account for geographical relationships. Uh, so if I, in Europe, make a policy on bioenergy, and that bioenergy is produced somewhere. It might, might uh, mean in that there's, uh, in South America, bioenergy bio produced, which could lead to deforestation. And so I also geographically, I have to understand everything. So that means that at some point in time, it becomes a little bit too, dif too difficult to do everything with your head. And that's why in climate science, uh, we basically use quite a lot of models. And that we're not doing that because we feel that we can predict the future. Uh, the next U.S. elections or uh, a war somewhere makes the future completely different. Uh, but we can use these models to explore pathways and to understand a little bit the dynamics of how things work. And basically, we have three different areas where scientists are using models to try and understand how possibly the future, future could evolve uh, with respect to climate change. Uh, there is one set of uh, scientists that are looking into how will human activities evolve into the future, what kind of technology choices do we have, and how does it affect emissions. There's a second group, which are meteorologists, uh, which are looking into if, if there are emissions, how does it lead uh, to climate change. And so they, they build these very large physical models. And finally, there's a whole group of people, mostly ecologists and ge geographers, uh, that try to understand, okay, if the world gets warmer, what are the consequences of that? Uh, and can we, uh, and are they those acceptable or are those threatening? And so we have these three areas of research. My own research is mostly on the left side. And so that's what I'm trying to do, uh, trying to make scenarios of um, future human activities <coughs> and how that leads to greenhouse gas emissions. So now focusing a little bit on what comes out of that. This is uh, the development of greenhouse gas emissions uh, on the left. Uh, so that is CO2, nitrous uh, oxide, and methane combined, and CO2 on the, on the, uh, in the middle. Now CO2 is by far the most important greenhouse gas, first of all because it's in volume, very large, but secondly also because it's very long-lived. Uh, so the, if we put CO2 in, in the, into the atmosphere, Part of it will stay there for centuries. And so that's why we also focus mostly on CO2. So this is the historical projection. So we can see that since uh, um, 1970, but also before, greenhouse gas emissions have been constantly rising. There are, there are some dips uh, with, with crisis. The late, latest one is the COVID uh, dip. You can see that last, last blip in the end. Yeah, but by now, in 2021, we are simply, unfortunately, back to the emission level of 2019. So the next thing that we do is try to develop scenarios of how things might evolve. And, and so we're, we're telling stories with computer models about what would happen if people would continue to rely heavily on fossil fuels and economic growth would be relatively fast. Or what would happen if there would be a, some, some kind of a shift. And uh, maybe population growth is fast or slow, and so we make all kinds of projections, uh, and that's indicated here. These are projections in the absence of climate policy, and so these are basically projections that we make where we describe the world as we saw it uh, in the last decades. But still, there's, a, there's an obviously a huge amount of uncertainty. In the IPCC report, we also added a second set of projections which are basically the best estimate of what would happen if countries would actually implement cl climate policies. 
And so we made a database of the 6,000 climate policies that we could find in different countries. And we made our best estimate of what those would mean. And that uh, resulted in the, the red line and also the uh, uncertainty range that is around it. Uh, we asked different modeling groups to uh, estimate what, what the effect is. That's why we have an uncertainty range. Uh, but basically, it means that if countries start to implement the, the current climate policies, emissions would more or less stabilize. That's already a little bit less than the projections that we originally had for what would happen if you simply continue as we were do doing historically. Uh, but I, I will show that this is clearly absolutely not enough uh, to, to reach the Paris or to really prevent dangerous climate change. But the, so the basic story is current policies, more or less stable emissions. So if we now would like to understand what that would mean for climate, we can run these large climate models uh, of the meteorologists, but I can also do a little trick. And the little trick is I simply look into the IPC report and I look up all the projections that have been made by these models and I plot the cumulative CO2 emissions, so that's the CO2 emissions that is put into the atmosphere against the, 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 climate, the temperature output that these models produce. And actually you can see that all these models are in agreement pretty much. And so there, is, there are models that are a little bit more sensitive, so they would be on the upper side of that pink plume. There are also models that are a little bit less sensitive. Uh, sensitive. Uh, they would be on the lower side. Uh, but we basically more or less have a, a strong agreement among the climate scientists of how the system works. And in, and in principle, the more CO2 you put in the atmosphere, the warmer the Earth gets. Now, that graph is very handy to have because we actually what we can now do is simply calculate the integral under that CO2 uh, emission curve from the, in the middle uh, and then then we know how much CO2 is emitted, and then put it into that graph. We, we, ca we can't start at zero, unfortunately. We have to start at the point of 2,200 gigatons of CO2 that we have already emitted into the atmosphere in the last 150 years. So we have to add, that, add to that. Uh, but then we can take this 40 gigatons of CO2 from st being stable, multiplied by 80 years, and then we can calculate how much climate change that will cause. Yeah, and so, unfortunately, uh, it doesn't come out nicely on the projector, but um, what you would, should have seen here was this line uh, at uh, current emissions going up, and then you would have seen that for this middle, that middle scenario, uh, you would end up somewhere between 2.2 to 3.5 degrees of warming, depending on whether you believe the least sensitive model or the most sensitive model. Um, and you can see actually that number directly in the IPC report. The IPC report has this number in, in there. And so we could have, could have done it here on, on a single slide. Uh, but also, you could also have looked in that scenario, but it's also still possible, where we don't have policies, and then you would end up at about 4 degrees. So is this bad? Now I already indicated that there is a third group of scientists which are looking into the impacts of climate change. And their work is summarized in that graph. And what they, what, they, what they have done there is look into five different classes of climate risks. On the left, you have the risks of, for sensitive systems. Uh, think, of, for instance, of coral reefs. Uh, we know that coral reefs are impacted by climate change. We also know that with, with one degree, they're already suffering. We know that with two degrees of global warming, they're probably uh, gone. And so that's indicated in that graph as well. Uh, this, so being dark red means uh, very high risk, being white it means low risk. A and so for these ses sensitive systems, you can see that it moves from yellow to uh, dark red uh, at around two degrees. Another form of impact are weather extremes, uh, so heavy rain or uh, uh, flooding. And again, um, they have tried to map that in terms of temperature. And you can see again that uh, for one degree it's yellow, for two degrees it's dark red. The, the third and fourth column are actually connected. And there they have tried to indicate I events like uh, reduction of crop yields. And so those crop yields reductions, bad uh, negative impacts on crops, can be local, only in Africa for instance, or they can be s such a scale that it ha has an effect on the global 
uh, crop yields. And so the third column is indicating local effects. Fourth column is indicating that this, this effect is so large that you would have a, a global impact. And again, they have mapped uh, at what temperatures they believe these kinds of impacts would be really, really important. Now again, uh, it, it's uh, two, two degrees would be for local impacts and slightly higher for uh, large-scale global impacts. And then we also have the risk of large-scale discontinuities. Uh, so that would be, for instance, uh, impacts on the uh, Gulf Stream, uh, which could be heavily slowed down. We believe that this is even possible already at two degrees. So yellow, very high risk, also very high consequences. Uh, and uh, the likelihood increases also uh, if the temperature continues to warm. Now that 2.5 to 2.2 uh, to 3.5 degrees warming uh, is in the red zone for everything. Uh, and so current policies are still bringing us heavily into the red zone. That 4 degrees warming that I was talking about as well, if you don't have climate policies, that's absolutely in the dark red. Uh, so that's things that we don't want. And to make it even more relevant for the Netherlands, Sea level rise. Uh, so this is sea level rise. The point there is 2100. Uh, that's, um, and then you have a, a, the blue graph indicating about 2 degrees warming and the red graph indicating uh, 4 degrees warming by the end of the century. The main point is that sea level rise will simply continue and continue uh, if we have uh, temperatures uh, above 2 degrees uh, by, by the end of the century. Uh, and so maybe that one meter of sea level rise for the four degree scenario is something that still is doable in the Netherlands uh, by increasing dikes. Uh, but at some point, that three degrees or four degrees or five, de uh, sorry, four meters, five meters, six meters, that is indicated uh, for that red scenario, at some point that becomes simply for the Netherlands impossible uh, to defend itself against. Uh, and so, for, for the Netherlands, it's clearly very important uh, that we try to avoid being something somewhere above that blue line. Uh, and so very lo locally, uh, we have a very clear interest. And policymakers already saw that. Uh, and policymakers already in Paris agreed, OK, we, we don't want that. Just let's try, try to stay well below 2 and preferably 1.5 <coughs> degrees. Now, now we have, luckily, uh, it, does, it doesn't mean no climate change. Eh? You're, you're still, uh, even for the for this, this uh, unique and threatened systems, you're still in the, in the red area, with, even without something like that. So you will have climate impacts. We will have to adapt to climate change. Uh, but we, we think that this is still something that is doable and would give us a manageable amount of climate change. So now we can use exactly that same graph that I had before to determine how much CO2 can we then still emi emit if we want to meet those goals. And, and so if you then read that graph at one and a half or well, well below, and then we have to first make a, make a choice. Are we going to, be to believe the most sensitive model? Or, or are we going to take a risk and uh, read it out at the least sensitive model? Now that last might be a bit harsh. Uh, we have one Earth and then believe the least sensitive model that doesn't seem feel, feel very right. And, and so what we have done is actually say, OK, let's make sure that we, we, we are right in at least two thirds of the models. And, and so we read it out at uh, this 30, 33, uh, 33rd percentile. Uh, but that is still dubious, uh, because you're still somehow a little bit gambling uh, with the planet. Uh, but OK, this is what, what we have done. And so we get for 1.5 degrees we get then a 400 gigatons of CO2 carbon budget. And for uh, well below 2, uh, if we take that uh, at, the, at the 66 percentile, we get a uh, 1,000 gigatons of CO2 carbon budget. And now I'm going to put those numbers into perspective, uh, because it is really not a lot. And I'm going to compare these numbers to that graph. And what it's showing here is 400 gigatons of CO2. Uh, because the current emissions are 40 gigatons of CO2. And so it's 400 gigatons of CO2 is about 10 years current emissions. So if we would continue in that stable line, uh, but in 10 years, we simply have reached the 1.5 degree. And so if we, if we act as we're currently doing, by 2030, we would be at that 1.5 degrees. 
Alternatively, uh, if you go down linearly, it means that you have 20 years. Uh, so by 2040, in principle, you would have to be at zero emissions. Uh, that is really fast, uh, because most of the power plants we build are meant to last at, lo at least 40 years. Uh, so basically it means we have to build from now on everything carbon-free, and even then we have to um, prematurely uh, get rid of some of the ex existing fossil fuel infrastructure. So this is a tough call. Um, could we have done much better? Yeah, we could. This is, this is also 400 gigatons of two, uh, CO2. If we had acted after the third uh, IPC report, I believe it uh, was published around that time, and simply had already believed uh, the science at that time, this is the pathway that we could have followed, uh, and simply uh, a, a very smooth pathway down. So we put ourselves as humanity in a very dire situation. Uh, we sim by simply not acting, uh, we made the problem way worse than it, than it already was. So that is also a, a wake-up call for if we do continue on that pathway, we simply are going to make that slope steeper and steeper and steeper. Yeah, so there is a little bit of uh, additional um, uh, hope, uh, which could help us a little bit, which is that there is also a way to get CO2 out of the atmosphere. Uh, first of all, by planting forest. Uh, and so, uh, there, therefore, there's th th this helps a bit. There's also, there are other possibilities. There are technologies where you take CO2 from the atmosphere and would store underground. You could also, for instance, have bioenergy and then combine it with uh, CO2 capture and put it underground. And so there are different ways where we can get some CO2 out of the atmosphere. But that is really not unlimited. And so there is an unlimited amount of land where we can put forests. There is a limited amount of land, if any, where we can grow bioenergy. And also the amount of CO2 that we can store underground is not unlimited. Moreover, if we really go well below, well past that 1.5 degree and then believe that we can come back by all kinds of neg uh, negative emissions, yeah, that means that we have at least temporarily uh, overshoot the target and will have those impacts that are associated with higher temperatures. So you don't really want to go that way too much. But it gives a little bit of additional freedom. And so if you run the models of IPCC and you ask them, give me a scenario that leads me to 1.5 or uh, give me a, a scenario that leads to well below 2, this is the answer that these models give. And so they have now combined all kinds of technologies and uh, behavioral changes and as a result resulted in these two pathways. Uh, again, the colors don't really come out nicely, but what you would, would have seen was two funnels, of, uh, and one was, is associated with 1.5, the lowest one, and then the slightly higher one that's, uh, that's normally purple uh, is going to well below 2. So they reach net zero CO2 at a certain point of time. And so the 1.5 degree scenarios reach net zero uh, at around 2050, but in, uh, th what they also do is they reduce emissions already by more than 40% in 2030 globally, and they start peaking emissions uh, before 2025, more, more or less immediately. The well below 2 degree scenarios, they give a little bit more uh, room, and then maybe at 2070 we can be at net zero, but that is only true if we start to reduce emissions today. Otherwise, we can get the same story as that graph that I showed you earlier. Uh, if you wait too long, uh, you still you are eating up the cake very, very fast. And then at the end, at the end there's only a small bit of cake left. Uh, so in both cases, act very fast now. Uh, emissions reductions in 2030, somewhere between 25% globally and uh, 40%. Uh, and, and then reaching net zero by the middle of the century. So the question is, how do we get there? And we can re uh, use these models as well to get an, an idea of that. Uh, and so the models will try to find a combination of um, efficiency improvement, trying to reduce uh, demand for energy, demand uh, also for uh, biomass, uh, food and timber, which can be done by uh, technology, partly, uh, by uh, insulation, for instance, and by lifestyle change. Then, obviously, we can also try to make energy more 
uh, carbon neutral. Uh, we can produce energy in, in ways that doesn't create CO2 emissions. Renewables uh, are a way to do that. And there at least there is some positive news. Uh, I have plotted the cost of solar panels and wind power uh, on that graph, and they decreased rapidly. And so by AR5, uh, that was the last report that before the current one that was published in 2014, uh, we as IPCC still wrote uh, that renewables are very attractive. They can pr provide electricity at no emissions, uh, but they are a little bit more expensive than fossil fuels. By, two by now, we have to write simply that they are often cheaper uh, than fossil fuels. And so that, that, that made a huge difference, the, the cost reductions that had happened there. That doesn't mean that we can replace everything by renewables. At some point, you will, these, these forms of electricity are intermittent, yeah, so you have to find some solutions there as well. And then there's also this role for CO2 removal. And um, we have to decide as a society how much we want to rely on it, yeah, but it probably should be part of the picture, simply because we are now so close to that 1.5 degree target that there is almost no other way uh, to also have some role there. So there is uh, lots of different scenarios published by uh, these models and they show that there are different pathways. Uh, a little bit more relying on CO2 renewables, more relying on lifestyle change, more relying on renewables. But maybe now I would like to step up, uh, step, uh, a few steps behind and look simply at a distance to those scenarios and see whether they more or less tell a similar story. And they do. Uh, there is we know that uh, a response strategy to climate change always uh, consists of the following elements. Uh, so first of all, there's a major role for limiting demand. If we don't do that, uh, we simply can't really cope with all kinds of supply side changes with renewables. At some point, simply demand needs to uh, be re not to grow as fast uh, as under baseline projections. And this can be done by, uh, as I said before, a combination of technologies, uh, efficient technologies and possibly lifestyle changes. And then uh, renewable energy plays a major role, simply to benefit from the fact of all those cost, cost reductions. Yeah? And so the, our ma main first target should be to make sure that electricity supply becomes uh, neutral. Uh, and that is partly based on renewables, um, part, partly based on other things, I'll come back to that. But if we are able to get um, electricity supply neutral, it also means uh, that we can try to benefit from that by, in all other sectors, trying to make uh, things uh, electrified. Uh, because that's, you benefit from the fact that you would be producing electricity at net zero. Uh, so going from uh, fossil fuel cars to electric cars is very attractive um, in, all, in all kinds of industries. Trying to move to ways of using electricity Makes this makes simply the whole story easier. Now, as I said, uh, renewables would not be the only solution. We, it doesn't always. Uh, there's not always wind. There's not always sun, and so you have to have some other backups in that system, uh, which means could be batteries. But at the moment, that is still uh, uh, not possible. So we have to think of other ways also of system integration. Maybe carbon capture and storage plays a role. Maybe bioenergy could play a role as well as a more reliable uh, energy source. Nuclear power in some, uh, some countries might be, might, might be attractive to choose uh, up to what governments would like to do. But you need to have something in that system as well which would uh, provide reli reliability. And then in end use, yeah, electricity can play a role, but not for, every, not for everything. Yeah, so uh, currently for uh, heavy trucking, for shipping, uh, for uh, air, uh, air, air traffic, maybe also for very high heat uh, applications in industry, we don't know how to do that with electricity. And so there are other options. Maybe hydrogen, maybe carbon capture and storage, uh, maybe bioenergy again. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. I'll, I'll wait, I'll wait a, a moment still. Yeah, so reforestation is in any case also part of the story. I have already indicated eh, that negative emissions need to be there. Reforestation is one of the most attractive ways to, to get that eh, because it can potentially be combined as well with other uh, targets like uh, biodiversity protection. But at the same time, 
and there might be more necessary on, in terms of that negative emissions. I'm not saying necessarily that we have to use these technologies, but at this point of time, I would say develop them at, at the very least. Uh, actually, that, that is an attractive strategy to, to, to go into. And non-CO2 emissions need to be reduced heavily. I didn't focus a lot on it uh, in, the, in this presentation, uh, but um, we have to reduce the methane emissions associated with energy production. Now there we have the nice thing that if we phase out fossil fuels, we also phase out the methane emissions related to uh, oil and gas. But there's also a lot of methane and N2O coming from livestock and from rice production. And there actually we have technologies to reduce these emissions by about a third. But there is not more technology than to offer there. We can't reduce further than, a, than about a third. It does mean uh, that among the lifestyle change options, diet change might be one of the most attractive ones. And simply because we don't know how to reduce the, these uh, methane emissions and N2O emissions uh, further. And the, the story here is actually that just going back to a healthy diet, so simply taking the health recommendations on meat consumption and, uh, and, and accepting that would already reduce meat consumption by quite a lot. A and so maybe our ambition just to go back to some to uh, meat consumption levels that are healthy for our body uh, would help also a lot for the health of the planet. So if you look at this, uh, we have these five major system integrations, uh, system transitions. We have to start producing our goods in a different way, we have to travel in a different, different way, we have to get, make sure that our buildings are uh, going to net zero. The energy production system, uh, the electricity needs to be diff different, and, and uh, we have to think about the food. And these are not only technology changes. Uh, while in my presentation I focused quite a bit on, so on, on the role of technologies, it, it, these transitions are much broader. Uh, we have to change the rules in how these systems are governed, uh, we have to provide the infrastructure, uh, and that's a story of where both government and uh, consumers can have a role. It's not only uh, speaking to consumers clearly, uh, because I can't take um, a public transport option if the infrastructure doesn't allow me. Uh, and also in changes in how industry works, it's not something that I can do. But I can make some, make, make some choices as well. Uh, and so clearly there's there, there these two responsibilities, and somehow we, we, know we don't have to only to change the technology choices in these systems, but we simply have to also make sure that the, the systems, the governance in these systems works in a way uh, that makes these transitions possible. And then this dec decade is crucial. Uh, I already indicated, if we just would uh, stay stable, then 1.5 degrees is, is by 2030 completely out of the window. Uh, and so we have hesitated a long time but uh, the emissions simply need to go down now if we want to make have any chance of meeting 1.5, but also well below 2. So what has been the progress so far? And then I come back to the same scenarios that I've uh, published, uh, that I've looked at so far. Uh, and so these are is again the no, the no new policy scenarios, the, the 2 degree scenario, the 1.8 is the well below 2, and the 1.5 degree scenario. And so I blow them up a little bit. Uh, in principle, yes. And so I'm now I'm only focusing on the period up till 2030. And then I'm comparing the scenario without new policies, the current policy case, the 1.5 degree case, and the case of staying uh, below two. And, and so compared to that no new policy case, it's a 60% reduction for 1.5, it's a 40% reduction for well below two. Now in the Paris Agreement, uh, the, it's a bit of an odd agreement. We have uh, made a promise for all countries together to in, uh, stay below, uh, well below two. And then it says countries should do what they want to do voluntarily to achieve this. And, and these voluntary promises are the NDCs, uh, that the, net, uh, the National Determined Contributions. Now countries at least took it to some degree serious, eh? so they have made promises. And if you add up all those promises, then you get at, uh, at the moment to that 70% emission reduction. And then if we use that database of the 6,000 policies and see what they are really doing, uh, then they are implementing at the moment about 9% emission reduction. And so they didn't promise enough, 
and they're not doing what they promised yet. Um, there was some expectation that this would happen. Yeah, so in the Paris Agreement in 2015, uh, they built in this stock take, this global stock take, which is act actually happening in 2023, uh, where uh, there is a discussion and where countries should look into their eyes seriously and, and, and see whether they um, believe that they uh, are doing the right thing. Yeah, the, the bad news is actually that the original plan was that they, uh, in Glasgow, would already realize this and would have strengthened their commitments. That didn't happen so much for that 2030 thing. Uh, what they did do, and that is helpful to some degree, is that they at least made promises now for 2050 to go to net zero and some countries to 2070. And so there is, at least in, at least in promises, some progress, uh, but it's clearly not enough. It's not nowhere near the, the things that we have to implement. And so the pressure should be really on these uh, governments uh, to, in, in 2023, take that stock take much more serious. Uh, because the, actually the next stock take is in 2028. Uh, so that's clear that is way too late uh, to uh, make the change. Uh, so the change should happen in the next few years. Am I completely uh, desperate? Um, I see negative things. I see also at least some positive things, and I would like to share that. Um, the budget is clearly almost depleted, huh? and so and, the, and we have this ambition gap and implementation gap. At the same time, there are some positive things. Uh, we have seen these technology breakthroughs. Uh, so for it, it is remarkable that renewables are now um, at almost uh, at the same cost as fossil fuels. But also for electric cars. In 2014, the IPC report said transport is maybe one of the most difficult sectors, and maybe we have to go to biofuels. By now, uh, in uh, 2035, the EU has decided to really get rid of new uh, fossil fuel cars. Uh, and so electric cars all of a sudden provided an option there. It's not the ideal option, and you obviously have to combine it also with uh, public transport and other, and, and other forms of mobility, but at least there is some help here. We have the net zero targets. Not enough, too late, but at least they are there, and that means that even countries like China have uh, taken up some responsibility now, at least in, in terms of what they have promised. The IAA, this is the International Energy Agency, that was originally established to uh, secure the fossil fuel demands uh, from the OECD countries, uh, to make sure that we had some power against the OPEC. That organization is now for predicting the end of fossil fuels. Uh, and so there's also some changes happening there. And uh, also the financial sectors, you see that, uh, for, for, uh, for example, the Dutch National Bank uh, is warning uh, against fossil fuel assets. Uh, so change is also happening there. So it's, I deliberately didn't make the balance uh, completely horizontal or being positive, but there is also some room of change, and you see it happening at the moment. So I have so, f so far focused on the global scale. Unfortunately, the, one of the Difficult things why we got ourselves into this trouble is obviously the different interests of, of countries. Here we, we see the emission developments of the, of the world, USA, Europe, and China. And if you look at CO2 emissions per capita, uh, you see that uh, the USA is about three times the global average. Uh, uh, EU is, is a bit above the global average. China is also above the global average. And then we have obviously a lot of countries that are below the global, global average still. Um, if you look at the contribution uh, of today of the OECD and uh, the Russian Federation, um, just to count uh, uh, rich countries, that's about a third of global emissions. Uh, so it's clear we can't solve the problem without also speaking about the other two thirds, which are coming from developing countries. But historically, two thirds of the emissions came from, that, uh, OECD, from the OECD countries plus Russia. And so we get this big discussion uh, with uh, us asking them to help, and they indicating, yeah, but how did we get in this, uh, this, place, uh, this place in the first place? And can you at least um, s solve your act first? And this gives pretty much the deadlock that we had for a long time in the negotiations. It has changed a bit uh, with the net zero targets from India and uh, the, uh, China now. 
uh, but um, yeah, this is still uh, making it really, really difficult. And so climate justice is absolutely something that needs to be on the agenda to have any chance of solving this, this problem. And we have to take uh, simply our responsibility. Yeah, and so if we would calculate when uh, the regions need to be at net zero based on simply the cost, uh, which is often done in, the, in, in, uh, in these models, and then um, I already indicated 2050 more or less globally uh, at net zero. And then you see that uh, all kinds of countries like the US and would also need to be at around that period at net zero, according to the scenarios. But that is maybe not fair. And so accepting that we had another responsibility might mean that we have to go to net zero earlier. And then copying uh, in the Netherlands the same target that uh, globally uh, we have to be at net zero 2050, it might not be the, the way to go. Now, now we, we did take a, a full uh, greenhouse gas target, not the CO2 target in the Netherlands, uh, but clearly we have to be far, move faster uh, in, the west, in the West uh, than that global average to do any justice to the fact that we, are, we have a higher capability and historical responsibility. Yeah, and so maybe you want to be at net zero at 2040 and not in 2050. So for me, this is the summary. Uh, a rapid transformation is absolutely uh, urgently needed now, simply due to the fact that we have uh, waited so very long and all the, all the risks that are at stake. I showed uh, some of those on that graph uh, on the impact, uh, but it, it's cl clearly worth it. You can actually calculate also cost optimally uh, what, um, whether it's worth it. And then you actually also would find out that even economically, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a logical thing to do and to, to reduce emissions as deep as we can. Paris would mean uh, net zero around the middle of the century, uh, for according to the IPCC report, and I've showed you how you could easily derive that conclusion, and rich countries uh, somehow need to be going earlier. There are still ways to get there. Uh, we, we simply can achieve those targets by a combination of lifestyle change and, um, and technology change, and this decade will be crucial. Um, the long, there's also a long-term vision simply needed for those five crucial uh, transitions. In the Netherlands, we had mostly made an, a, a climate accord for 2030. I think it's really important that we make sure that that is much more detailed uh, for, the, for 2050 as, as well, so that we know where we really would like to be going and have an attractive uh, idea of um, how that transition could look like. Yeah, so... That's what I wanted to share with you today. And so I, I wanted to show what is in the IPC report and simply with a lot of graphs also show how you can ex ex uh, uh, derive the conclusions. So thanks.